Monday night chat with Wong Chen. Brought to you by the Member of Parliament for Kalanajaya in collaboration with Invo. Hi, welcome back to Policy Monday. This week we're going to talk about FDI. This is really inspired by the comment that Najib gave uh, criticizing Dr. Mare. Basically, Najib said that during Dr. Mare's time, Japan invested about 70 billion of FDI in Malaysia and uh, China and Hong Kong has invested about 63 billion during Najib's time. So why is it that he, Najib, get blamed for, being, for selling out the country or losing our sovereignty, whereas Mahade gets a free ride on the issue? So this week, we're going to explore the issue of FDI. Um, we, first, we don't know where Najib gets his 63 billion and 70 billion numbers, whether it's based on the time value scale. So he has to disclose a bit more details on that, not just make a bland statement. I mean, the difference is basically about 7 billion, right? Najib complains that people say that he's selling out to the Chinese, uh, but uh, Mahade hasn't sold to the, Chinese, to the Japanese. So poor Najib, always painted as a bad guy, you know, like the 1MDB scandal. He's so misunderstood in the matter. <laughs> so let's talk about MDI. Foreign direct investment in Malaysia. Let's give you the latest uh, three last three stats uh, three years ago. Uh, from 2014, the number was 35.6 billion ringgit. 2015, the number is 43.4 billion ringgit. And 2016, 47.2 billion ringgit. It looks like, wow, FDI in Malaysia in the last three years have been climbing despite the 1MDB scandal. But, except there's one, one issue wrong with the, the whole calculation. The Malaysian ringgit has tanked since 2014. So when we do the proper calculation and we, we look at it from the US dollar perspective, because all FDIs come in the form of US dollars and they come into Malaysia before it, it gets converted into ringgit. So... In, in US dollar uh, calculation, 2014 was 11 billion, 2015 was about 10.7 billion, and 2016 about 10.8 billion. So basically, it has in actual fact dipped slightly. Now, how do you measure FDI? Under OECD definition of FDI, if an investor, a foreign investor, invests more than 10% equity in a company, uh, that is recorded as an FDI. And the Malaysian Stats Department, credit to them, uses the same. Uh, system to measure FDI, okay? So what type of FDIs are there? Broadly speaking, there is greenfield and brownfield. I mean, there's vertical and horizontal FDI. Uh, those when I'm not going to go into it. Just very simple. Greenfield means starting from scratch. You build a factory, buy a piece of land, you start from very scratch. Brownfield means that the field has been worked or the factory is already there. They come in and buy an equity stake in it. So basic question is, are FDIs good or bad? Well, the answer is not so clear anymore. It could, it's a yes and no because with free trade and globalization, the FDI is a bit more complicated than it used to be in the 70s and 80s. Uh, what we know is FDIs do create jobs. FDI promises technology transfer. That is increasingly difficult as intellectual property rights have, have become more and more stringent over time. Technology transfer is no longer an FDI benefit. Uh, the other thing is, of course, FDI integrates our local economy into the global economy. That is good and bad, yeah? But overall, I would say that uh, FDI is, is, in comparison to domestic direct investment, DDI, it is better for any country to focus on DDI rather than to incentivize and give more credit to FDI, yeah? So I would highly, uh, highly stress the point that while FDI is important, it is much more important to develop our own domestic capability. Now, to attract FDI, most countries would then roll out the carpet and you know, give tax incentive. In Malaysia's case, they even restricted labor trade union to be formed. Yeah? So there is an argument that um, generally FDI today uh, favors so-called economic colonizers over domestic workers. It is an extreme point of view, but they do have nuggets of truth in the matter. Now, I'm just going to give a very short history of Malaysian FDI. In the, in the 1970s, uh, Malaysia observed how uh, the Singaporeans attracted a lot of FDI, foreign FDI, Western FDI in particular, to invest in Singapore. And so in the 1980s, when Dr. Mahathir became Prime Minister, he looked at the same model, but basically looked East, because he's got this hang-up with the colon former colonial masters from the West. So the Look East policy basically brought in uh, a lot of uh, Japanese investment. Yeah? And we basically allowed uh, foreigners to own land, we allowed foreigners to own 100% of companies, certain companies. Some of them require a 30% uh, stake, Bumiputra stake. 
But broadly speaking, we basically liberalized the whole economy. So in the 1980s, 1990s, Malay, Malaysia enjoyed, under Dr. Made, a big FDI boom. And that created jobs and brought us to the global economy. Uh, but what has happened since the 1997 crash, in particular, after Dr. Made imposed capital control, the whole FDI scene sort of changed because capital control is the big no-no. You cannot prevent foreign investors from taking their money out when things are bad. Yeah? And then what you have is a double whammy, the whole Indonesian, Thai market, uh, Philippines, uh, even Vietnam caught on with the idea, the formula that we use for FDI, which is to liberalize the economy. They went on and opened up their economy and started attracting FDI to their country instead. So what has happened now is that uh, we've reached a stage where um, things are now uh, in, the, in year 2017, or basically starting from 2015 onwards, we've looked at a really slowing down of the FDI in Malaysia and the rise of uh, Vietnam. You know, they're not, not just beating us in soccer, they're beating us in economics as well. So this, gave, this rises, uh, gave, gives rise to the issue whether uh, can, we, can Malaysia face up to this thing and regain back FDI. Yeah? And it comes back to the first question when we started off, who sold off Malaysia? Now Najib claims that Mahadeh sold away Malaysia more than he's trying to sell to China. Yeah? Uh, the question is political, of course, but we, it can be answered quite simply. We just have to look at the type of FDI that has come in. In the 1980s and 1990s, when the Japanese invested in Malaysia, they invested primarily in creating new uh, factories. You know, so uh, say Sony will set up a Sony Malaysia here and start manufacturing, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, you know, all these Sumitomo, all these companies will start and come and invest here. But they were private companies. They were not government-linked companies of Japan. Yeah? They're not related to the government. Now, in 2017, 2015, 2016, 2017, when Najib starts to pivot to China, the Chinese uh, FDIs are slightly different. The Japanese set up factories from private companies. The Japanese also invest, uh, became contractors for mega projects. Yeah? Let's not deny that. Now, the Chinese are slightly different. Yes, they have private companies. For instance, Geely take over Proton, and that is pure business. It's not to, not related to so-called government, uh, government Chinese government's uh, grand master master plan or strategy. Second, China is also doing a lot of contract work, building you know Bandar Malaysia, building up some buildings in KL and KL, KLCC area. Uh, those are also contractors like Japanese as well. Yeah, but what the Chinese are doing and the, that the Japanese did not do is two things. One, they've invested in property, country garden, Iskandar Malaysia. All these big chunks of land have been given to the Chinese to sell to Chinese. So that raises the issue of whether the, uh, the Malaysian government is selling out property belonging to Malaysia to the Chinese hand. Yeah? It's an emotive issue. I'm not too concerned about it, but it is an, a politically charged issue. The second, the, the, the second more difficult issue is that Chinese linked companies are now buying Malaysian ports and Malaysian power plants. And if they get into the, if they start building this uh, high speed train and ECRL, we don't know what their composition or their ownership of that is. That raises the issue of infrastructure being controlled by China. And we don't blame China for this. You know, we blame the Prime Minister <laughs> for, you know, for, for running down the economy, for having the 1MB scandal. Where we're so poor now, or at least not, we're so tight in money that we have to go to China and beg and sell national security matters such as our infrastructure. And that should answer the question why Dr. Made, uh, FDI's, Japan FDI did not sell out the country, but Najib's FDI to China could potentially sell our sovereignty to them. That's it for Policy Monday this week. Hi, for Q&A this week, we're going back to a, a longer format because I'm a very Chong He fellow. So we're going to do, instead of 90 seconds, we're going to do 120 seconds, which basically means two minutes. So questions as usual, some of them are prepared by our staff and also interns. Some of them are actually from people, uh, you know, via Facebook. Okay, so I'm going to have the first question now. First, my views on TPP to be signed on the 8th of March, I'm a bit disappointed by Justin Trudeau. He goes to Davos and comes back with a TPP agreement, right? For us in Malaysia, I want that uh, the meeting officers and also meeting minister to brief us before he signs this agreement. So I expect a caucus meeting on the 8th of, well, before the 8th of March. 
and that uh, we are given full extent and, and, uh, and tax on what is going to happen. Number two, Meeting Minister uh, Mustafa says that trade protectionism is dangerous for the world. It really depends which world you live in. If you come from the first world, you like free market, you like, you like uh, liberal trade uh, policies, then trade protectionism is dangerous for you. But if you are a third world country or you are a developing country, trade protectionism, that, that means to, to develop your own core strength is more important. Yeah? Number three, what are my views on the Undi Rosak campaign? Everyone has a right to exercise their powers to vote. Uh, you know, but I think the Undi Rosak campaign is misguided because Malaysia is not really a democracy. Yeah? And in this coming battle, it is so crucial that every vote counts. And to take this time to, un to rosak your undi, I don't think it's very smart. Number four, postal votes. Uh, is it good? Is it genuine? We cannot guarantee postal votes. What we know is we saw some numbers for certain seats that came in during the 2013 election showing that the government had more postal vote support than us, which is illogical because most people who are outside Malaysia hates the government. <laughs> Number five, uh, what is the most important thing to do during elections? I can't, I can't uh, stress this most. It is really Pacha training. Counting agent. We need counting agents to protect democracy. So people who want to do Undi Rosak, please reconsider. Don't Rosakkan Undi, but just go and become a counting agent. Do that instead of doing you know, something ridiculous. Yeah? So that's it for this week. We have about three seconds. Yeah? Goodbye and uh, have a good week.